Thank you so much for the invitation and the organizing committee for, for having me here. It's, uh, it's really, really uh, an honor uh, for me to belong as a staff, staff surgeon in this uh, legendary institution. And, and overall, you know, having to work with such a, a, a remarkable perfusionist that make my, my work and the work of our team very, very easy. And, 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 and I'm very, very proud of uh, to, to, to belong to, to this group. So uh, the, the, the talk that I have today, the plural is an aortic aneurysm management, but uh, I think uh, uh, since it's a perfusion conference, so I think I'm going to give it a perfusion strategy. So how to uh, manage these uh, 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 aneurysms and, and pretty much there cover some certain basics and, and, and the reason why we do it and how we do it. So just to go to some basic definitions in case that, you know, sometimes when, when we were in the middle of the night and, 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 and some of the, the, the students say, hey, what we're we doing? We're doing an aneurysm, we're doing a dissection, we're doing, a, uh, you know, so it's kind of like uh, uh, that we got to go up to the basics and, 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 and say that the aortic aneurysms, and it can go from a dilation of any portion of the aorta that extends from, you know, to the root, all the torque abdominal aorta, the dissection, which is the, the, one of the catastrophic situations that we see overnight is just a, a tear separation and between the intima and adventitia and uh, the flow goes into you know and, and into the false lumen and, and compromise everything uh, uh, downstream you know they create mild perfusion and, and, and aortic uh, pseudo aneurysms uh, we also talk about many times about acute aortic syndromes they can happen in any part of the aorta but we're focusing pretty much in 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 what uh, entails the, 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 you know, the proximal uh, thoracic aorta, it can be a dissection, it can be a penetrating ulcer, intramural hematoma, all the situations that we see that require attention and usually surgery in, in, in any, any, any time, any minute. The, when it happens distal to the aorta, these uh, problems, they can either wait treat medically or can be um, a treat with uh, uh, endovascular therapies and most of the time, sometimes it requires surgery too. The next, one. next one. All right, so just going back to uh, remind everyone about the classifications. We use the Baker classification and absolutely, and uh, and uh, well, the Stanford sometimes you know, it's a Stanford B medical management, usually Stanford type A, uh, uh, you know, either way, a type two or, or, or type one. Usually, we uh, we we treat the type ones and type twos in the in the war. And uh, the important reasons that we treat these dissections is because we're trying to prevent that. I think uh, if you look at the, what are the reasons that people died of dissection is because uh, one, pericardial tamponade. Sometimes when you notice when, when we open the chest and we open the pericardium, uh, sometimes it's like, oh, do you see a bloody pericardium future? But it's not because it's ruptured, it's because the aorta kind of sweats around and fill the, the pericardial, pericardial uh, space and, and that can cause this pericardial tamponade. So that's one of the reasons that people die. Congestive heart failure, you know, the dissection extends into the non-coronary sinus, cause uh, aortic insufficiency or, or, or compromise of the coronaries, a stroke, and myocardial infarction, you know, if you dissect one of the coronaries. So usually the people who has a, a dissection into the coronaries, usually they don't make it alive to the hospital. So, uh, you know, when they come and, and the coronary is dissected, they're usually very, very, very sick people that uh, usually the outcome is not very good if it's not uh, being treated properly. So uh, the dissection can happen in, with mild perfusion in any, in any uh, uh, basket, part of the vasculature, but you know, the important thing is that at least from 20 to 75% people have mild perfusion in the renals, um, also uh, open and lower extremities. And the less common is in, uh, in the mesenteric circulation, coronaries or, or, or spinal cord. So thankfully, because uh, uh, this is the post, probably the most devastating, you know, you with heart failure, you with paraplegia or, not having a gut, it's just uh, pretty much a dead sentence. So uh, we have to remember, remember that uh, this is a lethal disease and 24% uh, of these people, they don't survive. Uh, even if you treat uh, an aortic dissection with uh, surgery, 19%, they will still be dead uh, after surgery. And, uh, and, and not even mention that you decided to go to medical management, the mortality is uh, uh, 50 to almost 100%. So what we're trying to achieve when, you know, when we, when we call you guys in the middle of the night to help us out with the cases is just to is to expedite and do an urgent open aortic repair. And, and, and the main, the main, the main uh, 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 goal is to excise the, the site of this uh, ulterior aorta 
replace that there with the graph replacement and, and reestablish the, the, the flow and the true lumen. Uh, sometimes, you know, according to the, the complexity of the case, uh, either way you have to uh, replace the, the root if it's dilated or, or it's a marfan patient, as I said, you have to replace the, root, replace the root or replace the arch if it's dilated or it has a big tear and um, in the aortic arch. But uh, fortunately, this is uh, less common. And uh, usually we uh, uh, try to get the patient alive out of the table and uh, replace the hemi arch and ascending with the uh, with suspension of the valve so the patient can go back. And, uh, and, 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 and you know, we, we deal with the, co the consequences of complications after. So uh, usually the algorithm that uh, we try to do and it's just uh, if your patient has a, a malperfusion coronary cerebral malperfusion is going straight to the OR. If and um, plus minuses, you know, if it has some mesenteric ischemia, sometimes the approach is take it first to the cat lab and do a quick fenestration of the renal or the mesenteric arteries and then go back and, and perform a few hours later, uh, according to the stability of the patient um, and do the, the, the ascending aortic aneurysm repair. So uh, pathology with aortic arch, you know, uh, doing a total arch, uh, as you know, it's a, it's a big enterprise, a team approach. And uh, uh, fortunately here with uh, Dr. Coselli and, 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 and our group, and Dr. Provenza, we, 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 we are very lucky to, to have this referral of that. We do these cases in a, in a, in a daily basis, but uh, it's not very common, you know, for, for people to start doing a, a total large surgery outside in the community. As you can see, you know, also uh, all the arches, they are not uh, just, I'm gonna do an arch. It's usually uh, include something else, you know, includes a yortic valve, a mitral, a coronary bypass. So all these things add complexity to, to, to what you're trying to achieve. Uh, this is uh, uh, some of the reconstructions that we do, you know, the classic hemi-arch that we always call it about hemi-arch, but in reality it's a proximal transverse arch reconstruction. There is no hemi-arch, but, you know, people have uh, 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 know this. Uh, total arch replacement, when you know, what, once we debranch all the circulation of the head vessels and beyond the arch, preparing the patients for, uh, 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 you know, trying to do an elephant trunk, frozen elephant trunk with the stents and, and, and set them up uh, for a second stage uh, elephant trunk completion. So, uh, you know, in order to achieve that, you know, it just, uh, we have to come with some techniques to try to, you know, to go into this route that is, you know, the, the surgeon in Russia, they do 3000 patients, so usually kids, they put these people in, a, in ice and they're just perfusionless. So, you know, imagine you got to kind of like a cold patient and, and, and put ice and operate as fast as you can. And, you know, the, the, they realize that all these uh, kids that after the operation, even if they, they didn't have a, a, a severe uh, brain damage, they realize that those kids have some sort of, uh, you know, development issues and cognitive issues and deficit attention disorder issues. And, and um, you know, they're always a brain damage. So in order to, to, to not to have to go that route, so that many, many pioneers before us, they, they, they tried to solve this, uh, uh, a problem is how we're going to perf perfuse the brain. Well, so the goal is after this is minimize all the injuries and the clinical effects after this. And uh, the many has been talk about uh, what about the metabolic amounts of the brain. You know, you you don't you know the most important piece of that you got to protect is the brain, but also you don't have to, to forget about to protect the rest of the body. You know, the kidneys, the guts, you know, the legs, everything matters. But the brain is very. Uh, egocentric organ, as you can see, is most important. It just doesn't like to share blood with anything. And um, uh, he likes to be in a, a, a constant aerobic glycolysis. So use uh, fresh ATP. If you put it in an, 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 an anaerobic uh, uh, situation, so the lactase increases and it's very toxic to the neurons. So uh, uh, uses 50% of the total cardiac output and 25% of the total body glucose. This is, is what the brain is so important. Uh, this is a, a, probably a paper that everybody should quote and, and read. It's a, it's a classic study by uh, Dr. McCullough and the group of Mount Sinai in New York that actually they test uh, how the test the limits of deep hypothermic circulatory arrest, how far you can take uh, people down. And as you can see in, 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 in the left side is that the metabolic demands of the brain, they're never zero. They're always, they're always even if you cool down the patient to five degrees, and sometimes physically impossible, you still have some brain activity. But, uh, you know, fortunately, you know, to, to, do, to do these repairs in the circulatory arrays, they figured out that uh, uh, you need, you know, probably safe limit is around 40 minutes, uh, 15 degrees. So you still have some uh, uh, metabolic demand, so 16. So that's, don't forget about this uh, number because that's why, you know, this 16%, you kind of like uh, uh, 
complemented with the anti-grades or retrograde cerebral perfusion. So I think uh, uh, this is uh, what uh, a lot of what we do is based on, and, 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 and everybody should uh, read this paper once in a lifetime. Uh, what options do we have for circular rest? Is, uh, either way, we go straight to hypothermic circulatory rest, retrograde cerebral perfusion, or anti cerebral perfusion. Which method disappear? I think it can be a debate of uh, you know every single meeting and, and organization is every single time is just preparing what is best. I think uh, the one is what it works for the surgeon, what it feels comfortable because there is no randomized clinical trials that one is better than the other. But one thing we know is that probably it's better not to go straight to deep hypothermic circulatory but uh, just to complement it with something else, retrograde cell perfusion, anti cell perfusion, just to supplement that 16% that you are taking when you, you, you when, 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 based on the, the graph that I mentioned in previous uh, day. Uh, Dr. Provence have already mentioned this, but uh, you know, around the community, uh, many people are changing back to anti cell perfusion. Uh, still, deep hypothermic circulatory rest, many people believe in still and, and doing it, and, and it's not a bad thing, but the, you know, the perfusionists and surgeons need to be comfortable doing this. RCP is effective. You know, uh, this group from uh, uh, Dr. Girardi, Cornell, uh, Dr. Girardi trained on Dr. Puselli, so he, Dr. Puselli back in the days, he used to do a lot of retrograde cell perfusion, so he's taken that way and doing his cases in that way, but uh, the important thing is that uh, we know for the graphic that I've concerned before, you know, for the temperature drop that uh, you have 40 minutes, but what happened after 40 minutes, if you complement with something, you can extend uh, the, 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 the time of your surgery a little bit longer and without pretty much uh, a, a neurological events, you know, permanent neurological deficit or transient neurological deficit. So what about uh, uh, cognitive levels when you, when, you, when, you, when you do a retrograde or, 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 or anti-grade? Uh, this uh, study by Dr. Benson, no difference, you know, in terms of clinical stroke, visual uh, uh, neurological symptoms, peripheral twitching, delirium, seizure, apparently they're all the same. The same thing again, this meta-analysis, anti-grade versus retrograde cell perfusion. I think uh, 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 these meta-analysis favors they use either way, wherever feel comfortable, ACP or RCP, but you know, they kind of like uh, feel less inclined to, do, to use, uh, to use uh, deep hypothermic circulatory rest alone. And um, this uh, study about the Dr. Sellis group, uh, is the warmer temperature safe? Yeah, uh, yeah, they, they prove that it, it is, but uh, probably uh, if you cool down the patient, the incidence is probably to stay in the ventilator for, for a day more or have more transfusions because you are cold and more uh, coagulopathy probably is the only thing that is deleterious to this, but you know, it's just no difference. And, uh, and going back to how, you know, how we could perfuse these patients, you know, everybody's asking, say, well, what are you going to do? Yeah, what what uh, uh, kind of relation do you start you going to use? So pretty much any artery can be used as a source of inflow. As soon as it's not dissected, thrombosis or, or, or with massive calcifications, you can use the femoral, you can use the axillary, the nominate, the carotid, you can use the rectal aortic cannulation, the subclavian, both sizes, transapical. And uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar right now, but they're popularizing the samurai technique in dissections when you, you don't have any, any source of inflow where the use is, is just cannulate directly. But in order to do that, it's just you pretty much got to put a snare around the, uh, the ascending aorta and you have to drain the patient and then, then you stick the candle and then you start flowing and, and, and start cooling. So uh, I think it's uh, probably something that uh, uh, is, you know, uh, some people who want to venture and do this, they, they will start, you're going to start probably seeing this uh, a samurai type of candidation. Uh, but the goal, we, we don't need to forget about it, is that uh, having an uh, inflow with, which is dissected to thrombosis, you can create more macrofusion because then suddenly you're going to, you have a dissected denominator, you have a dissected axillary. Sometimes you can flow, and that's what we always test the line, and you know, won't, won't pump, and you know, it flows okay, and you know, everything looks looks fine, so you can keep flowing. But sometimes, you know, you, you have a high pressure, high resistance, you're not flowing fine. It means that you're flowing in, in the fast zoom, and you're creating more mal perfusion, and, uh, and that's a problem. So you have to, to either way add another cannula or change your, or change your cannulation strategy. So, uh, not very common, but uh, you know, when uh, when when it's an, an emergency, we use femoral artery, and uh, obviously this thing uh, you can see in the CT scan and, and and predict it in advance if it's a good vessels to cannulate. So you can do that uh, when you expect uh, a long cross clamp time and a long procedure. So it's better to saw a, a graph that uh, uh, is gonna 
it's going to allow you to keep perfusion distal down the decks and uh, and not occlude the femoral artery downstream and and, and you finish at uh, you know about the 300 uh, in the pump case with no legs and you know, fasciotomies and and the patient can lose extremity just because of that so i encourage you know that that you expecting a, a, a long pump run and, and using and, and using a femoral cannulation is better to uh, uh upfront sewing up a, a femoral uh, uh, cannula there uh, graph so what about the axillary cannulation? I think uh, this is the workhorse for many, many places. Uh, it's the right axillary, but it, again, it doesn't have to be dissected, it doesn't have to be calcified, it has to be you know, accessible. There are some people who are 500, 400 pounds and just, you know, you spent that an hour, an hour and a half trying to, to get the axillary, so probably, you know, and, and the patient is an extremist, it's just not uh, the, the road that you wanna go, so you gotta, you gotta uh, look for another source of, uh, uh, inflows. So here, uh, the important thing is that somebody asked me one time, is like, why do you guys did you just put a cannula in it in the direct into axillary? Well, they, they did it before and they felt miserable with a lot of uh, 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 problems with, you know, the axis, you know, the problems with uh, dissections and neurovascular complications. So that's why uh, the group of Cleveland Clinic, specifically Dr. Sevic, uh, popularized the, the sewing in a graph. And since uh, 1998, you can see uh, right now, I think everybody uses a, a sort of graph. Is this an eight or 10 millimeters? I think we try to guys to make you happy, you know, because you, you saw an eight in a big patient and just all oh, the pressure, the, the line pressure is 300 and everybody gets an arm. You know, I think I'm, I'm happy with that. We can flow, but you know, we want to, accommodate uh, the perfusion uh, the perfusion needs and usually the pencil the BSA you know we, we choose a 10 millimeter graph and and, and, and or eight millimeter so I think uh, at the end it's just as you can have a, a decent cardiac index to flow it's, it's fine regarding the, the, the pressure that you get in the airlines so this is uh, what we see you know uh, as you can see it's full of uh, structures so you know the the the, the brachial plexus is right here so uh, you 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 have to you know be careful to respect that because you, you can have some some uh, 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 neurovascular uh, you know uh, complications. I mean, like a patient can have some uh, problems with the strength in the hand and so on. Uh, uh, a lot of people are concerned about hyperperfusion of the arm and and, and they tie distally so they don't they don't hyperflow the arm. You know, uh, is it's a complication well described, but usually we don't do it, but uh, you know, it can happen. And, you know, it's just uh, according to the surgeon's preference, they want to put a uh, uh, tie or tie one around to, 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 to uh, try to avoid this complication is described. Um, again, it's the same video, you know, you just stick the artery and sew in a graph. So uh, either way, you know, uh, I think we talk about if you use a perfusion via axillary or, 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 or innominate artery cannulations, there is a, uh, depends. I think, uh, you know, you gotta be, feel comfortable uh, doing a, a, a axillary cannulation, take a couple of uh, cases just to feel comfortable doing this. Uh, but, you know, both they're, they're, they're good. That they simplifies the liver of anti or perfusion and, and it's a good source of uh, uh, perfusion. So the important thing here is that, you know, you're, you're a denominator, you're including some, partially including some flow to the carotid. So you have to be, uh, you got to do, uh, uh, and, you know, expeditious way to sew in the graft and, uh, and keep the pressures by anesthesia a little bit higher, the historic pressure around 120. And obviously we do this with uh, uh, nears and uh, if we know that the nears they're coming down so either way uh, you will abandon the case or increase the perfusion pressure but you know it's just as soon as uh, partially occluded I think uh, you know 99% of the times you're going to be fine so in this uh, 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 perfusion cannula so there is a uh, more advanced techniques that once you know you, you, you you're trying to do the arch you can either way uh, once you, you know you the, the branch techniques first and then you just uh, move uh, the perfusion according to what best secure implanting sequentially and uh, the cannulation of the ventricle apex is also that this is, is, is being described. You know, when you don't have access, you know, you, as, you feel comfortable with a samurai or other techniques. You know, kind of the apex is always there. It was described by Robichek, the same guy who uh, does the, 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 the sternal uh, closure with uh, uh, the, the weave around the, the sternum for, for complication and, and, and chest closure. And uh, it's uh, uh, provide the same thing. It's just uh, it's as fast, and, and, and the, the apex of the ventricle is right there. And useful in cases that you know you don't have another another way to cannulate this patient. So there is a, a quick video here that uh, uh, Dr. Sally facilitated me, and uh, you know he's uh, putting this uh, seven-year technique in the cannulating, putting the wire up, and 
and just put your, your camera to the apex and you gotta make sure that you cross the left ventricular alpha track and then just uh, start perfusing through there. So direct aortic cannulation is also also that uh, is uh, is also that is being done and uh, you know let's just uh, use the epiaortic ultrasound try to cannulate through looming with the cellular technique and and either way you use the ultrasound on the table or the TE and uh, just cannulate and go on pump and you, then you have to adjust your you know your 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 sequence and how you're gonna uh, perfuse the brain once you. Uh, you know, stop the pump and, and, and resect the tissue, and then you get going to integrate or retrograde serum perfusion. So there is no difference. Whatever you use, I think it's a uh, word of Dr. Provences and whatever you use for, for this and right accelerator versus nominate. Uh, and what, uh, you know, we use, uh, you know, when I think of the, the cooling is, the warming is as important as, as the cooling. And, uh, you know, we also had tried to not to overwarm the patient and maintain a gradient and, and, and perfusate in less than 10 degrees and stop rewarming once you're 36.5. Sometimes we, you know, uh, recently we've done a hey, warm up to 37, but, you know, we're watching carefully and then we never, we never get to that. It's just to set it up the heat exchange or higher. So you guys can, can give us a, some time to, uh, uh, just those patients, you know, they, they drop the temperature pretty fast. So you try to gain a couple of minutes so you can correct the coagulopathy. So I worked on the surgical adhesives. You know, I think we it's very common to use uh, bioglues, and uh, the implications for perfusion is, you know, I think uh, uh, you have to either way when you the surgeon is going to apply uh, some sort of bioglue, you gotta you gotta be aware of that, and either way you gotta stop the pump, and uh, there is some time to you know to dry it up because uh, there's been cases and report cases that the bioglue just embolizes into the brain, and then you have to scoop those things later in a. Um, uh, uh, with the help of nerve intervention or radiology, the patient will have a stroke, you know, and, 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 and it's very important. Also the same thing when you apply bioglue to the root, it's important to just stop the, the, you know, the sump that you have there. So with this, I just uh, conclude and I'm open for questions and uh, thank you for the opportunity again. Thank you for the invitation.